Hi everyone and welcome to this new Open Up a Masterclass. If it's your first time watching, um, it's very good to have you here. My name is Romé and at Open Up we're on a mission to make mental well-being accessible uh, to all. As a part of this, we host a monthly masterclass about a mental well-being related topic uh, to explore it together and completely dive into it. Today we're going to be talking about the ego. Uh, we're going to look at what it is, how you can recognize it in yourself and also um, in uh, how you can change it to make it work for you instead of against you. Uh, to discuss this, we've invited the leading expert on this field uh, and she's called Roos Vonk. She's a professor at the Radboud University in Nijmegen in uh, the Netherlands uh, and she's also written several books about this topic. Uh, and this session is inspired by her newest one, which is called My Ego is Always Right. Uh, before we dive into the topic, uh, I would like to uh, uh, share some practicalities with you. This is a live event, which means that you can uh, interact with us in several ways. You can reply with emojis, but you can also uh, talk to us in, uh, in the chat box. There's also a separate field uh, with a question mark. And if you click on this, you can leave all of your questions in, uh, in that specific chat box. And people can also vote for your questions if they also think it's, uh, it's interesting. Uh, I'll be watching from the side of the screen, collecting all of your questions in, uh, in the chat box. And then by the end of the session, I will ask everything you want to know uh, to Rose uh, in the form of a QA. and a um, So that's it uh, for the practicalities. Without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to uh, Rose Punk, And I wish you uh, a very happy masterclass. Hi there. Um, to uh, follow up on the announcement uh, just made, my, my book's only been written in Dutch, so uh, you can't read it. But to cut to the chase, um, your ego is not always right. On the contrary, it's almost always wrong. So that's what we're going to talk about today. And uh, I've, the title of my presentation is The Totalitarian Ego, which means that our ego works like almost like a totalitarian system like Russia and Putin, we've seen a lot of that in the news in the past year. And um, the totalitarian system means that information is filtered and censored and distorted in such a way that the desired image is created. And basically that's what we do with, by means of our ego to create a positive self-image. We are usually not aware that that happens because it happens unconsciously so underneath under the surface there's a spin doctor inside of us distorting information to create the desired image at least for people with with high self-esteem a positive view of themselves which we call psychologically healthy so most of you probably have that um, you have to realize that a lot of things we do happen unconsciously so to get to know others, you have to realize not everyone is like you, but to get to know yourself, you have to realize that you are basically just like everyone else. Because many people, when we talk about egos, many people say, oh, I know a lot about the egos of my colleagues and my friends and my, uh, my, my chef, my leader. But we never see our own ego because it works unconsciously. But um, you have to accept that, you know, if we look at how we are physically like how our kidneys work, we accept that even though we can't see that, that it works just the same as everyone else's kidneys. Now, the same happens with our psychological makeup, and I will tell you a little about that during this lecture. Um, so the adaptive unconscious, that's how psychologists uh, term it, because unconsciously we do a lot of things that have an adaptive function, they're functional, and we don't realize that we're doing that. And some examples are, it's, it's usually compared with an iceberg. So a large part of what we do is hidden underneath the water. We can't see it. For instance, a lot of our perception is, happens unconsciously. We, we record lots of things without being aware of it. A lot of interpretation of events in the news, impressions of other people, happen unconsciously. Our locomotion, how we move, how we walk in a street with many people and don't bump into everybody, how we stay steady on a bicycle, 
that happens unconsciously or language how we produce grammatically correct sentences while consciously we're focused on the contents of what we're saying or how we get ideas or the solution to a problem we're thinking about or our preferences in terms of food or the kind of books you like to read or the kind of movies or which people you like or don't like a lot of that ha is governed by unconscious processes and we usually become aware of the result so we realize that we like this person and we don't like that person or we have a certain impression of someone so we are aware of the result but we we are not aware of the process that led up to that result that most of that is done unconsciously because unconsciously we have a very large information processing capacity so it's good that our unconscious takes over a lot of that work now that means that if you look at yourself the beliefs you have about yourself and why you do the things you do why you like the things you like a lot of that we don't know we think that we have unique access to ourselves by means of introspection but when you look inward you only see the results of many cognitive and emotional processes and you don't see the process themselves so for instance you usually don't see your own ego at work this totalitarian system behind the scenes you don't usually see that um, whereas you can often see that in other people so this means that if you want to get to know yourself it can be very helpful to get feedback from other people now I will present you with a multiple choice question here if you could select feedback and you can choose between four different persons you my question to you is which from which person would you like to have the feedback and there will be a poll presented to you after I've discussed the four options um, the first person imagine is someone who knows everything about you there is to know and who will tell you the honest truth whether you like it or not everything there is to know about you this person will tell you the second one is a positive person so this person will tell you things that are good likable and competent about you the third one will give you information that's congruent with how you look at yourself so it will fit with your self-image if you have a positive self-image this could overlap with the second one but of course you are also aware of your weaknesses so the third person will give you also information on everything that fits with your beliefs about yourself and the fourth one will give you information that will help you learn and improve yourself so this can overlap with the person who tells you the truth but this fourth person will give you only information that you can do something with that you can actually work on improvements so there's a poll now I think um, and I'm interested you may think well I would like to have a little of all of that because these are four motives that are important to everyone but if you have to choose I would like to know which one you would select and I'm going to look at the results now and it's going up there's there's um, there, as usual most of you say that you would like to get information that can help you learn and improve and there's quite a lot compared with other groups here that say well give me the truth bring it on I will deal with it whether I like it or not so you will say you would like to have actual correct information about yourself including your weaknesses and this is actually what what people generally think they want but it's not what they actually prefer if you look at their actual behavior and you look at what they do when they get the opportunity to acquire feedback most people instantly and automatically look at positive feedback that's what they prefer to get and we're not aware of that because our ego is pulling the strings behind the scenes but it is what we prefer so we tend to look for positive feedback we tend to when we have a disagreement with someone to want to talk with someone about it who will say that we are right so unconsciously you will tend to look for positive feedback and it doesn't mean that the other motives aren't important but the the need for positive feedback is the predominant motive governing your instinctive automatic behavior 
And this has to do with the fact that we have an ego, which is a very dominant force in all of our preferences, our feelings, our thoughts, and our behaviors. And it's very often working behind the scenes in a way that we don't see it. So it's hidden underneath the water. We don't get to see it consciously. And this ego takes care of our self-esteem. So we want to have a good feeling about ourself, ourselves, and um, the ego helps us maintain our self-esteem, enhance it if necessary, protect it if necessary. And according to social psychologists, this works like a sociometer. So it's almost like the gas meter in your car. Your self-esteem is the meter that's connected with how, how other people look at you. So you want we, animal, people are social animals. So it's important for people to feel accepted in their group. They have a very strong need to belong. They want to be liked and respected by other members of their community. And our ego, our self-esteem is an is a instrument that registers whether people like us like us or whether they don't like us and monitors our belonging. So it's like the gas meter. And for instance, when you're in a group and you're making a joke uh, about a sensitive issue, for instance, the, the Russia, the, the, the war between Israel and Palestine that's going on now. Um, so you make a joke about it and imagine that uh, you fe instantly feel that this was not the right comment. People don't like it. So you just said something that they didn't like and everybody's quiet and you can feel, oh, this is not going well. Then your meter will drop. So you will have a bad feeling. You feel that this isn't going right. They don't like me. So you have a need to fix that. You want to get gas. This is your gas tank, your level of belongingness in this group which is connected to your meter and you want to fix it. So you want to get gasoline, social gasoline. So you're going to respond automatically in ways to fix your level of belongingness. For instance, you will make a joke about it or you will say, oh, I didn't mean it like that. Or you will make other people a compliment. You, you look really nice. What a nice atmosphere we have here to help people forget your clumsy remark or you will just lay low and say nothing for a while because you think, ooh, this is a dangerous area I'm in now, better not say anything anymore. And after a while, you kind of fixed it and you can relax and you can feel, okay, everything's back to normal now. And then your meter goes up again and then you can relax. So this is all governed by your motivation to be liked. You want to be belong in a group, you want to be respected, and when you feel that your level of belongingness is going down, you feel bad, and this motivates you to do something so that you can repair your level of belongingness. And what you basically do in this situation is that you let your behavior is guided by your strategic self. The strategic self is the part in us that wants to make sure that other people like us. This is very important to us, to our self-esteem, we want to be accepted, we want to feel we belong, and especially in situations when we feel insecure, when we get feedback from others that we may have done something that they don't like, that's when our strategic self pops up to help us govern our interactions and restore our acceptability and our belongingness. So, for instance, you feel insecure about something, that will create a need for you for approval and confirmation for others. So when you feel insecure, you would like others to say positive things about you to, so that you can feel good again. And this means that your antenna will be directed outward toward others. What are the desires? What are the needs of others? So that you can adapt to that, accommodate to what they want and feel liked and appreciated by others. But the result of that is that your antenna is not directed inward to your own needs, your values, to what you want. And this is not good for your self-confidence and your self-esteem because you're not in contact with your inner self. So inside, there's no connection. So you will feel insecure and this will again reinforce your need for approval and acceptance from others. So this is 
this is not a, a desired effect of our strategic self. The strategic self can help you in some circumstances manage your interactions when you've done something bad. But when it becomes a pattern, then you will lose contact with yourself. There's another variant to this. It also starts with the strategic self, with feeling insecure. But some people deal with that by kind of overshouting their insecurity, overcompensating it. So they tend to feel, be, act like, oh, I'm very important, I can do this, I can do that, do a lot of bragging about how good they are, and they're outvoicing their insecurity, maybe sometimes not even aware of it themselves. And in their interactions with others, this means that they always want to be better than others. They are not open towards others. They always want to show, I'm better than you. They're competitive. They're not open to criticism from others. And they don't feel connected with others. There's no connection. And this connection, in turn, will, is also bad for our self-esteem. It also makes us, deep down, insecure, because... Feeling connected with other people is very important for a species like Homo sapiens, which is a social animal. So we want to feel connected and embedded in a community. And if you're, you know, always trying to be better, you miss that connection. So in both situations, you're governed by self-image goals, both when you're insecure and feel, feel the need for acceptance, or when you're outvoicing it by showing how good you are and how much you're better than others. In both cases, you have self-image goals. You're preoccupied with how people look at you instead of with being connected with others. So you're not really in connection. You're, you're basically uh, offline in the interaction with others, which is not very healthy. So um, we want to look at ways to overcome that, to to manage our self-esteem without such systematic patterns of strategic self. And another thing we need to overcome is that um, the graph I showed you with the sociometer, which we tend to fix by means of strategic behavior, so recapitulating, I'm not sure exactly where I lost you just now. So we tend to, when we feel our level of belonging as jobs, we tend to repair it by means of strategic behavior, by being extra nice to others, for instance. But we can also fix it by means of what I call a quick fix, is that we, we, temper, we temper with the meter. Oh, I'm sorry, I wanted to go back. We temper with the meter. So instead of being nice to people, making sure that they like us, we can say, well, these are all very stupid people. I'm not interested in what they feel. They don't like my jokes and they, they don't know anything. They're not expertise on this subject like I am or I have much nicer friends at home or, you know, anything that a spin doctor inside our heads or the totalitarian ego can think of so that we can dismiss the responses from others. So this is another strategy that we use, which of course also doesn't help us feeling connected with others. And there are many, many examples of that in, in my field, social psychology. There's a whole array of strategies that we use to, to fix and repair our, any kind of negative feedback that we get from others. For instance, in case of failure, people very often say, it's not my mistake. So it was because of the circumstances, it was because of someone else. When they succeed, they tend to say, that's because I'm so good. And when they fail, they look for external causes for it. Uh, in case of negative feedback, people very often say that the feedback is unreliable. So a person who criticizes you, don't know what they're talking about, or a test at which you fail, people will say, this is not a reliable test. Um, people tend to take credit on the future. So if they don't perform very well, they tend to say, well, but later I will manifest my potential and then I will show how good I really am, but I haven't realized all of my potential yet. Um, another example is what we call moral amnesia, is that people tend to actually forget their moral transgressions. And you may think, well, I remember my moral transgressions all too well and all my social blunders. 
But of course, you don't know all the transgressions and mistakes that your spin doctor has effectively erased from your brain. You don't remember that. So it could be much worse than you think. And another thing is, in case of criticism, people tend to become defensive and hostile towards the person who criticizes them. And very often, in case of criticism, you get to see another side of people who are in everyday life very easy to go along with. People with high self-esteem tend to be easy to go along with. But in case of failure, when their ego is threatened, you te they tend to sh suddenly show another side. So these are only a few examples of the many strategies that our spin doctor has to fix our ego whenever it is threatened. And it means that our image of ourselves is distorted. So we, we tend to have a, a flattered image of ourselves, at, at least most people who we call psychologically healthy have that. Um, and essentially, it also, it also means that the downside is that whether your ego is small or, t or whether it's big, whether you're insecure or tend to overcompensate, um, we, we tend to be limited in our self-knowledge, in our authenticity, whether we show ourselves to others as we truly are and connect with others on this true deep basis. Uh, whether we can get to self-development and growth, because when you deny that you made a mistake and blame others, of course, then you can't learn anything from it. Uh, we are limited in our contact, in our connectedness with other people, because we're preoccupied with self-image goals rather than compassionate and concerned goals being related to others. And we're also limited in our freedom of choice because behind the scenes our ego is pulling the strings and it works like an instinct, it dictates your behavior and it means that you don't realize that there are other possibilities. So we would like, of course, for this gate to disappear and so that we can realize all of these things and without getting into a depression because I have to say there are people with a more realistic image of themselves, but they are usually depressed. And of course, we don't want to go there either. Now, my idea is that you could resolve it by transcending yourself. So you can't really get rid of your ego. It's a very basic part of our instincts. Uh, but you can rise above that and get a better picture of that ego when you're more aware of it when you realize you're just like everyone else and lots of things happen unconsciously including the ego and spin doctor and all that once you realize that you can look at yourself more critically and get a better view of it and one of the things that really helps in my view is that you Think of your idea self as kind of a signpost. So you will never, you will not actually become your ideal self. So the ideal is always, you are not there yet. But that's fine. You can look at it as something that you are going towards. So in difficult situations, when your self is threatened, or when you made a joke and other people don't like it, or when you get criticized, you can instantly respond from the needs of your ego, but you can also think of how would I like to respond ideally? If I am my ideal self, how would I respond then? For instance, in case of criticism, I might say, well, this makes me feel bad now, but give me some time to reflect on it, and then I will get back to you about this. Because when you get criticism, it hurts. So you have to acknowledge that anything that you say straight away will be affected by your need to repair the damage. So give yourself some time and respond to it later. And then, then the hurt will, will be worn away a little and then you can give a more effective response. Another thing you need is self-compassion because you need to accept that you have shortcomings just like everyone else, shortcomings and weaknesses. And you don't need to be perfect. So you need to feel compassion with yourself because only then you can see your shortcomings and your weaknesses and realize that they are there and that it's not the end of the world. And 
you may you want to be oriented toward movement and growth so you're never at any point in time in your life you're never fixed you're never at a stage where you can say well this is me and now i'm done i'm finished uh this is who i am you're always changing people actually change in the future always more than they expected even people who are older turns out from research that they change more later in life than, than they thought they would. So you will always be moving and that's good because the idea that you're always changing helps you accept your shortcomings because any shortcoming is a temporary state that you can later deal with. You need some control over your impulses or what I would call emotional toilet training. We live in a world where People say, I have a right to express how I feel, I have a right to utter my emotions. And this creates some sort of incontinence in many cases, where people just blur out everything they feel, everything they think, they think they have a right to. Whereas it could be much more uh, adult if you, main if you maintain your, keep your emotions to yourself, give yourself some time to reflect on it, because very often your emotions and your impulses are governed by your basic instincts and they restrict your freedom of choice. If you follow your instinct, you're, you're just as unfree as any other animal who follows their instincts. We humans have the capacity to see more possibilities, to, to take a step back and look at other ways in which we want to respond. But this can only happen if you are able to bear some level of discomfort. So someone criticizes you, for instance, or you say something stupid and you feel bad. And so you instantly want to fix that. But if you accept that it feels bad, give yourself some time to, to feel how that feels and to reflect on it, then later you can give a much better response to the situation. And this also means all of these things are interconnected, so it's not just you know, do this, do that, they're all interconnected. It means that you zoom out, that you look at the bigger picture. What kind of a person do I want to be? What kind of person do I want to become? Where am I going? So you're always transgressing toward, toward new horizons. So you could look at yourself like this. This is your path and you are never fixed at a certain stage. You're on a path, you don't know where it's going. And realizing that you're going somewhere will help you accept criticism, failure, or any other kinds of threats to yourself, because it's not permanent. It's something that can all, always change. So if you look at it this way, it can help you turn the knobs of the panel of these four different motives that I showed you. So I showed you the, um, the motives of wanting to know the truth about yourself, wanting to know positive things, getting congruent information, information from which you can learn. Now, you could say that your ego is kind of, it's always there. You can't turn it off. So it's just part of our instinctive repertoire. Uh, but you can pull up the volume of other motives. So if you look at yourself as on a path, and if you're focused on your ideal self as a signpost, well, this is about the direction where I want to go, then that could turn up the level of your motive to learn and improve. And then that could become louder than the motive to get only positive feedback and compliments and approval from everyone. So this is one way to look at it. And I think this would be a good moment to pause and see if you have any questions and I have some other slides that I can show you if we have time, but for now I'm interested in hearing your questions and also hearing if you missed anything during the interruption.
Yes, Rose, thank you so much for uh, for this really nice masterclass. Um, people were interacting a lot. We saw a lot of comments in the uh, in the chat and also questions, which I think uh, also shows like uh, of like how much interest this uh, this topic is also to people. Um, and uh, there was one question that I uh, want to dive into you, which was the most popular one uh, by far, which was um, uh, asked by Kelly, and she said, "What to think about people who say." I don't care what people think about me. <laughs> After what you said uh, of humans looking for this feeling of belonging, is this really true from them or are they hiding from something specific? Yeah, um, I don't know if you could call it hiding, but there's actually research showing that um, people who say, I don't care what other people think, they say that to impress others with how <laughs> independent they are. Mm -hmm. So um, they may not be aware of that themselves. So uh, they may see themselves as autonomous, but uh, but it's n it's it's not like that. There are no humans that really don't care what other people think. <laughs> it's just part of our natural instincts, mm -hmm. and I also think it's an illness of our Western society because in our society we tend to see ourselves as much more autonomous than we really are. Mm -hmm. So we think we can do everything by ourselves, but we're still an interdependent species, right? Yeah, and you know, people, for instance, saying, I'm not affected by commercials. It's, it's just not true. Mm -hmm. I just buy the well-known brands. You know, it's a, jo <laughs> it's a joke among yeah, people yeah. who make advertisements. I'm not affected by commercials. I buy the well-known brands. Mm -hmm. People don't realize that unconsciously they're influenced all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I once saw a quote which I quite liked. It's like, you shouldn't care about what like not care about what anyone thinks just choose the people that you do care about and just well, don't make not make them everyone yeah but that but that already gives you an illusion that you have a say in the matter mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> that's true that's true and, that you know i i think you can change that to some extent you you can affect where you focus your attention. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, you can focus your attention on getting approval in the social domain. And, you know, some people try to get approval from how many Facebook likes they get or Instagram likes. And and if you do that, I would advise try, try to look for another source of gasoline mm -hmm. because it's very unstable and wobbly. Um, and you can choose to focus your attention on your work, how well you do in your work, or you can focus your attention on your own ethical standards or your family, which are much more reliable sources of approval. So you mm -hmm. can shift your attention, but you you can't really choose. If someone's important for you, you can't really change that. Yeah. Yeah, so what you're saying is like the goal shouldn't be to not care about what anyone thinks or not need ever need approval because mm -hmm. we're really not built like that, but yeah. it's just to... Uh, be more try to be more aware of it or or what your sources of getting approval yeah be aware are. of it and be be in touch with it and especially on the moments when it hurts mm -hmm. because we tend to we tend to panic <laughs> when we don't get the approval that we need and then we tend to do stupid things mm -hmm. like you know rely on how much money am i making or how many instagram likes am i getting and you know that's just the bottomless pit mm -hmm. so so it's better to be in touch with uh, what hurt you. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. So what would be good uh, things to get approval from? Better than Instagram likes, for instance. Well, generally, um, people with more stable self-esteem mm -hmm. tend to derive their, um, their positive feedback from their work, their achievements, because it's something that you have more control over. So if you're not good at something, you could just try something else. Mm -hmm. And um, their achievements at work or in sports. And also from their family is a stable source of uh, approval most, for most people, of course, yeah. not always. <laughs> yeah. um, and um, something that's, that's harder to reach is your intrinsic sources of self-esteem. So am I true to my own values? Am I uh, engaging in self-development? Am I trying to discover new sides of myself? So mm -hmm. that's more psychological or spiritual yeah. um, contingency for your self-esteem. Yeah, that's also very interesting. So that the approval com comes from living 
uh, living uh, uh, true to your values and not a sp- and not specifically from based on the outcome. So like, mm-hmm. okay, I'm gonna try this because my values are to be curious and to be brave. And mm-hmm. then um, even if the outcome is is not what I hoped it was, like I will still feel. Uh, uh, yeah, still feel this gratification yeah, because I because you were true to yourself. True to See, this is this is a strategy that can work, especially for insecure people, mm-hmm. as in the circle of strategic behavior that I showed. Mm-hmm. People are in, who are insecure tend to constantly look for reinformation from others, yeah. and you can break the cycle by turning your attention inward and saying, what do I believe in? What's important yeah. to me? You can never really make yourself independent from others, but it does help to turn your attention inward now and then because, as you said, you can stay true to yourself, your own values, regardless of what other people do. Yeah. So it's a much more reliable source. Yeah, that sounds like a good place to start as well because then you that's within your control. Like you can never fully... Uh, yeah. Uh, control the outcome like what we just saw with for instance the wi-fi going down like mm-hmm. you, something just are out of your control but yeah. then if you shift it to what you can then yeah uh, that's interesting and and of course once you do that uh once you get better at that you can share that with others mm-hmm. so when you get criticized for something then you can say okay that hurts me because i was trying to be true to this value which is really important to me and uh, I have been doing my best to be true to that. Yeah. But it but it means that you can be more relaxed about admitting it didn't work because mm-hmm. you know you were trying. Yeah. Yeah. So I was trying, might not have worked, but at least I, this is what. My and you can share was. that with yeah. others, and that will help you build a connection. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Very interesting. There was also a question by uh, Aida, I hope I'm uh, uh, pronouncing it correctly. And she said, uh, she asked, like uh, you mentioned in, in the masterclass, that more realistic uh, people also tend to have more depressed feelings. Can you elaborate on that and explain like why that is? Well, it's very simple. Our self-esteem is strongly related to our well-being. Mm-hmm. So people with high self-esteem tend to feel better about themselves. So, you know, if if I put it, in a very simplistic way, I would say that um, high, high, high self-esteem is uh, not so nice for others because you tend to be very hostile and dismissive whenever your ego is threatened. And uh, low self-esteem is not so nice for yourself. Mm. So uh, high self-esteem people um, feel good about themselves. But especially when it's too high, like in case of narcissism, Uh, It's Mm. not nice for people dealing with them. (laughs) Uh, And low self-esteem people are, you know, they're not hindering anybody because they're always trying to lay low, but they feel bad about themselves. And low self-esteem people tend to not have all those distortions that I mentioned. So when when they fail, they will not blame others. They will say, oh, I'm not good at anything. Yeah. So, and maybe the even, other extreme. <laughs> yeah, that, that can happen yeah. too. So that doesn't mean they're realistic. But when you're realistic, you, you recognize that you're not perfect, that you have shortcomings. And um, if you, if you um, get your well-being from feeling good about yourself, of course, that will be damaged by it. Mm-hmm. So and that's why I emphasize the important role of self-compassion. Yeah. Because if you if you have self-compassion as your as your guiding tool instead of self-esteem, then you can be nicer and kinder to yourself and accept that you have shortcomings just like everybody else. Yeah. Yeah, so what I hear you say is that it's kind of like this this spectrum of like you don't want to be on one side where you're too narcissistic and don't take anyone's opinion into account, but mm-hmm. you also don't want to take it too far yeah. to like the other side in which um, yeah. and everything that happens is all of the sudden. Yeah, and, uh, yeah of course fault. you don't want that because it will that will also hinder your self-improvement mm-hmm. because you won't be um, taking the risk of undertaking anything new because you feel it won't succeed. When you look at yourself as a failure, yeah. you will not try anything new. So what you need to find is a balance, but um, you will have to accept that not everything will work straight away. Yeah. So you will fall and stand up again. Yeah. 
This makes me think of also a quote by um, Esther Perel, like a psychotherapist, and she says it's, uh, she calls it the ability to see yourself as flawed, but still hold yourself in high regard. Uh -huh. So to like see that you're not perfect, but also if you get feedback on improvement to still, uh, yeah, see yourself in high regard and not yeah. take it so to another extreme. And to, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's yeah. a good description. Yeah. yeah. And in case of self-compassion, you say, I'm a worthy person simply because I'm there. Mm. So self-compassion is based on Buddhism, which says anything that is there deserves to be there, is meaningful. Well, I'm mm. here, so that's why I'm meaningful. Yeah, so therefore I matter. So, yeah. yeah. That's, uh, that's a really beautiful uh, way to look at it uh, as well. Then there's um, a question by uh, Harry Vola, and he uh, was talking about people who always want to be uh, the center of attention. So people mm -hmm. who take up a lot of space in the room. Is that also connected to uh, the ego? Yeah, I would, I would say that that is connected to the narcissistic side. Mm -hmm. So, in ca and you know, I actually think, see, we always tend to call everybody that we don't like narcissistic. Mm -hmm. I, I think <laughs> yeah. we, we all have a narcissistic side in us. Mm -hmm. So, and I, I also think it's useful to try to discover your narcissistic side. So I think if you're really honest, when you think about imagine everyone thinks you're very special, everyone admires you. Whenever you speak up, everybody's quiet <laughs> because they all want to hear you your thoughts. It, yeah. <laughs> Wouldn't it be wonderful? Yeah. And I think even insecure, you know, insecure people might say, oh, no, I don't want that because everybody's going to pay attention. But you have to remember in this narcissistic fantasy, they all love you already. Mm -hmm. It can't go wrong. They yeah. will think anything you say is wonderful. So if you engage in that fantasy for a while, you get to meet your narcissistic side. Yeah. And that's good. And so I think people who, who are always trying to be the center of attention have uh, uh, given in to that narcissistic side. You know, mm -hmm. we've all, we would all love that, but most of us have, you know, some decency <laughs> to allow room mm -hmm. for others. So we, we kind of inhibit that tendency, yeah. but we would all love it. But yet at the same time, when you realize how wonderful it would be if you could give in to it, you also realize that it would not help you feel connected with others because mm. you would be so special and you would be on a pedal stone and everybody would admire you and you would not connect with others on an egalitarian basis, which is really what makes people most happy, more happy than anything is feeling connected with others. Yeah. Yeah. It's lonely at the top is what they right. always say, right? Yeah. yeah. And sometimes I also feel like it's when people do that, it's also because they're insecure or because they feel like sometimes you need to over scream something. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I think you're very insecure, but you're trying to cover that by protecting yeah. yourself by being so loud or yeah. by, yeah. Yeah, that happens too. That's the, yeah. that's the other uh, cycle that yeah. I do is yeah, when, yeah, you're, yeah. when you're out voicing your insecurity. Yeah. 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 But you have to realize we all have this narcissistic side and we also all have this insecure side. Yeah. So we all have some insecure person inside that's, and that's really the basis of our ego. It's a little mm -hmm. voice that says, I want to matter. I want to be special. I want to have a meaning in the world. And I'm never entirely sure if I have that. That's the yeah. insecure side. But I really like also what you're, what you're saying then also to then diving into these extremes with yourself. So really going into that narcissistic yeah. side and then seeing, okay, what is there? Because it can probably tell you a lot about yourself or like your deepest desires of how, what you want to be recognized for. Yeah. Um, yeah. And true. the same, same with yeah. the other side. And it's nice as, as a thought exercise to explore mm. that and allow yourself fully to go with the narcissistic side or allow yourself fully to go with the uncertain side, because that will show you where your sensitivities lie, where, where it could hurt. Yeah. Yeah. That's what you mentioned before, but like really feeling the hurt and like, mm -hmm. oh, but what, what is it really about me that is hurting when you give yeah. me this feedback or, yeah. or uh, yeah, really interesting. I think a very good thought exercise for everyone. Also very simple way to mm -hmm. start and also safe with yourself to just try that in your room and see where it takes yeah, you. Yeah. Cause, see... Cause you can't hurt anybody there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's also a, a, yeah, a good, uh, a good goal. Of course, when you try uh, these kind of things. 
Um, then there's also a question that I really liked by uh, Maurits, and he said, I feel most insecure with people when there's no feedback at all. Like mm -hmm. they don't respond, especially when you do things online. You might recognize it from doing yeah, this I now. Do. <laughs> how is that different and how to work on that? So, so this is actually what I had just now. So mm -hmm. you're just talking into the camera and you don't know if it's going yeah. well. And I solved this for myself by imagining that there's a very interested audience. <laughs> <laughs> so I try yeah. to imagine that and yeah. that helps. But, you know, it's a well-known phenomenon is that especially when you're insecure, you're very sensitive to not getting feedback. Mm -hmm. So whenever you, for instance, I, uh, I, I use an example myself in demonstrating that I, I put a response to a colleague's uh, Facebook post and she didn't respond to it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, initially I didn't notice it, but then the next day I started realizing she, she hasn't responded and I start thinking, maybe I said something wrong. Mm -hmm. and <laughs> yeah. So this, or for instance, when you give a presentation and your colleagues are there and they don't come up to you afterwards to say, this was great. Mm -hmm. Then you start thinking, I didn't mm -hmm. do a good job. <laughs> Yeah. Which, of course, is just, you know, filling in the blanks. Mm -hmm. there's, there's absence of information and your insecure part fills it in and says, yeah, I did something that was not good. But you, you're doing that yourself. Yeah. So you, you can only resolve that by asking feedback from others. Mm -hmm. And very often people are reluctant to do that because they say, yeah, but if I ask for the feedback, I might get to hear something that I don't <laughs> like. Yeah. But, you know, the worst case scenario is that you get the feedback that you already filling in, you're already filling in yourself. Mm. And, you know, usually it turns out that there's a very stupid, silly reason why people didn't respond. Yeah. So if you ask for it, hey, what did you think of this or that? Yeah, your your internal answer is usually the worst one. Yeah, right. <laughs> like you're your worst, yeah. your own worst. Critic. So you, yeah. you could just and you know if people didn't like your presentation, uh, they the, it's already true that they didn't like mm -hmm. it. You so might as well hear why. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you're not changing the truth. See, my motto is always get in touch with what's actually there. If they didn't like it, that's already true. Yeah. So you might just as well ask something, but you know, usually turns out that. There's another reason why mm -hmm. they didn't give you feedback. Yeah. And ag again, I think the exercise that you explained before then also works, like to see where your mind takes you mm -hmm. when there's no voice, because that's probably something you're insecure yeah. about. If it's immediately like, oh, they must have not liked it because of X, Y, Z. And X, Y, Z is probably what you're insecure yeah. about. Yeah. And that's, um, and that's very, a very, very nice, um, nice uh, way to realize that you're all of that you're doing yourself. Mm. So that's the insecure part of you filling it in. But you also have this overconfident part of you that also fills in a lot of blanks yeah. without being aware of it. Yeah, yeah. So we're just constantly talking to ourselves. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. In, uh, in that way. Okay, we're going into um, the, the final question of, uh, uh, of this masterclass. Um, and this is one by uh, Raluca. And she asks, would it be fair to say that the ego is a driver of a fixed mindset as opposed to a growth mindset? If you, um, if you yeah. look at the fixed versus yeah, growth I, mindset. Should I level. explain fixed and growth or does everybody know that? Maybe very group? quickly. It's good to recap. Yeah, because and, and, yeah, uh, the fixed that. mindset is, in a fixed mindset, you tend to think of yourself as static. This is me. This is how I am. And people are the way they are and they don't really change. And in a growth mindset, you look at people as changeable. So you always look at yourself as changeable. Mm -hmm. And the, the approach I've described is actually starts out from a growth mindset. So that's why I'm focusing on movement, growing, moving towards your ideal self all the time. So you tend to assume that um, um, you, you can always change things. And that makes it easier to accept your flaws because they are not fixed forever. Yeah. So a growth mindset has many advantages, and this is one of them. Um, yeah, I think I think the ego is. You have to realize the ego is an unconscious system, mm -hmm. so it works in a very primitive way, and I would imagine that it doesn't really care about fixed or growth. <laughs> it, like all our other instincts, it only cares about the here and now. 
So if you look at other instincts, you know, the need for food, like when you're hungry, you want food now. Uh, you don't start thinking, I may not be hungry later. Mm, yeah. That's not how instincts work. They have to give you an immediate response to the situation at hand. That's the function of our instincts. So the ego, similarly, when, you, when you're doing something that other people in your environment don't like, you have to respond here and now. Mm -hmm. And so, for instance, you made this stupid remark and you have to say something to correct it or show others that you mean no harm. Yeah. It's very functional. So I would say the ego is fixed in the sense of it only cares about here and now. It doesn't yeah. matter to the ego uh, that things mm -hmm. may be different later. Yeah. So then it's probably more about the conscious part and what you do with it afterwards because what then you can reflect and be like okay that was my ego responding um why is it responding like this mm -hmm. what's hurt did it trigger why yeah. uh, did and then you can m create a growth mindset right yeah. where you do improve it and and uh, yeah right so if you can manage to to overrule your ego by bearing bearing the discomfort of not giving into it mm -hmm. then you then you get control over your instincts. Yeah. Then you can say, okay, I feel bad now, mm. but I will bear it. And then later I will have a wiser view on it. Yeah. So yeah. I'm, I'm just going to park my ego somewhere. <laughs> and if I, if I need it later, it's yeah. very welcome to fix things for me. Yeah. Yeah. So parking it is a, is a good, uh, yeah. Parking it and bearing the discomfort because it bearing discomfort doesn't kill you. And mm -hmm. anything that doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Mm -hmm. well, I really like that as a as a final uh, as a final note. So, Rose, I really, really want to thank you for uh, this great masterclass, um, and I want to thank everyone at home for uh, for watching. Um, I wish you a very, very uh, happy uh, afternoon and evening, and I will see you in uh, the next one. Bye bye. <laughs>